Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Psalm 128, verse 126, verse 3. Our first scripture this morning comes from the 23rd Psalm. So turn with me, if you'd like, to Psalm 23. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our second scripture comes from Luke chapter 5, verse 27. Luke 5, 27. After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he left all, rose up, and followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The word of the Lord. I've had some people asking also about how this whole thing with the pulpit and the, the, the studies in the life groups is going to be working, and this is kind of how it goes. Um, I'm going to be preaching on the very topic or the very portion of scripture that you'll be looking at in your life group in the videos. But I didn't listen to his sermon so that I would preach the same sermon. I studied it for myself and then believe and trust God and his Holy Spirit to direct me to the things that would apply to us here and to our context and the issues that we're facing in our lives the section that we're going to be looking at this next week is chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, which is quite a large section. And so in some senses, what we'll be doing here is kind of like a survey. But even in that survey, I believe that God has directed me to the things that I need to highlight and that we would be able to look at in God's word um, this coming week. So, here we go. Verse 1 of James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. For those of you who have reared children, you know what it's like to see them start to walk. First, there's these um, tentative steps, and they fall down, and they get up again, and maybe there's some tears and, and all this type of thing, but Eventually, they, can, they get the hang of it, and they start to walk. Unless you are like my son, Josh. Uh, and, and by the way, we have this rule at our house that if I'm going to use one of my family members for, as an illustration, I have to get their permission first. Otherwise, I have to pay them five bucks. <laughs> and, and, but see, there are my, most of my family is not here. Except Josh is here today, so I had to ask him. I had to ask him yesterday if I could use him. So, and I did. So we're okay now. See, what happened with Josh is that when he was learning how to walk, he decided that he wasn't going to do it unless he could do it right the first time. So he would go with his little hands. All he'd get up on on uh, and, and lean up against something, whether it's the furniture or the wall, and just kind of walk around like this and just kind of shuffle all around the house. And so there was this dirty hand prints about a foot and a half all around the whole house. And he would do this for a very long time. 
Until one day, I, I was a youth pastor, and we were sitting around with our youth group. We're having a Bible study in a circle, and uh, he was on somebody's knees and just kind of turned around and walked across. Never fell, just, and that was it. He was walking. That's how he had, So that's out of the ordinary. Usually, we have to try to walk, fall down, all that type of stuff. These v- verses here in James are beginning to help us to understand what walking the Christian life is about about living it out in everyday life. And yeah, there are some times when we fall. There are some times when we have to learn some things that we didn't know before. Some ways in which that we have to try it out, and and if it doesn't fit, then we try something else. And, And James is doing that for us. He's helping us to be able to see what living out this Christian life is about. But who is this guy? Who is James? Well, here he says, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's all he tells us here. But from the book of Acts, we know that this is James, the brother of our Lord, and the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Now, what does that tell us? Well, he was one of Jesus' younger brothers. So you think, well, yeah, that kind of makes sense. You know, a leadership dynasty, you know, Older brother passes it on to a younger brother, and so on. That happens all the time. The thing is, we know from Scripture in Mark chapter, chapter 3, verses 21 and, 21 and John 7, 5, that his siblings did not believe that he was the Savior of the world and the Messiah. They thought he was nuts. And so, what happened? What's going on here? Well, a couple things that I was thinking about, first of all, was it could have, the reason why he didn't have credibility with his siblings, first of all, could have been that they had seen him grow up and saw his human side. They saw him learning skills by trial and error, just like anybody else would learn things by trial and error. He was learning um, how to apprentice as a carpenter with Joseph, his father, like any other young man would do. Um, They would see that he had to learn to read and write, just like anybody else would. They might might have even seen him get picked on by the neighborhood bullies, because he was a bit different. And he used the outhouse, too, just like everyone else. So it would have been kind of difficult for them to look at this person as being Messiah, He was just one of the family. On the other hand, though, James lived in the shadow of a perfect older brother. Now, when I think of that, I think of what it would have been like to be Joseph and Mary, to think about talking to James and saying, James, why can't you be like your older brother? He's always obedient. He never gives me any lip. He is so cooperative when it comes to cleaning up around the house and conscientious about his chores. James, why can't you be like Jesus? And so there could have been in his family this idea of of resentment because they had to always be compared to an older brother. I don't know if that was happening. But for people who knew that James grew up in that family, There was an aspect of how people would know that of anybody in the world at that time who knew what it was like to see someone live the Christian life, it would have been James. He had seen it lived out in his life, in his home, in real life, in real time. He had lived with a perfect example longer than anybody else had. And so he would have had a very good understanding. And that's why I believe that God chose James to write a letter about that. Because people would have known this and it would have kind of given them a sense of connection with the material that James was going to write about. James wasn't content with only talking about a positional or theological sense of what righteousness and holiness looked like. He was wanting people to know 
what it really looked like lived out. And you know how inspiration works, right? The way that the Bible was written by inspiration was that God would give the words to those who wrote it, but he didn't leave it out of the personality of the person who was writing. That was, it was colored by that as well. The two of them came together. And so when God gave James these words to write, he also did it through James's personality and his background and his reputation and the way that people understood him and they came perfectly together. And then it says here in verse one, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. These were Jewish believers who had to leave Jerusalem because of persecution that was going on. And so they were scattered throughout the whole Roman Empire. All, and they would have had to have been uprooted. They would have had to have uh, their families, gone away from families, learning new languages, uh, perhaps even learning new uh, skills and new trades. But they were leaving Jerusalem and went out through the whole of the Roman Empire. And so these Jewish believers would have needed some kind of guidance and direction as to what does living the Christian life in this place look like? I know what it looked like in Jerusalem. That's where I grew up. That's how, what I know. I know that part. But what does it look like in Spain? What does it look like in Egypt? And so he wrote to them and gave them this, these types of instructions. It was kind of like hometown pastor writing a letter to people who used to live in Jerusalem but now are living all over the Roman Empire. So, I'm sure you've read these passages before, or at least many of you have. And very often what we do is we take some of these paragraphs in isolation from each other. But that's the, the brilliance, I guess, of doing a survey is that you can see the bigger picture of how they work together. And that a passage on temptation and a passage on wisdom aren't apart from each other. They actually work together in helping us to understand a bigger picture. And that's what's we're going to happen as we start going through this passage today. There are basically two themes that come through these first 18 verses. Partly, the first part we're going to look at are the ways that um, we, are, we can grow in our Christian walk. And then the second theme is ways to understand that growth. All right? So let's start. Um, I'll read verses 2 to 4. The first way to grow is through trials. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I know you don't want to hear this, but for us to grow, we need to sometimes go through difficult times, hardship. I know you don't want to hear that because I don't want to hear it. And I'm kind of the same as you. But we also know if you've been around and you've been a Christian for a while and you think back of the last time you had a, a boost in your faith, a time when your trust in God was increased, it was one of those times, wasn't it? It was one of those difficult times where you were cast on God and you said, God, how am I going to get through this? I, I, I don't know how this is going to work out. I'm, I'm having such a difficult time. Please help me. And you trusted God, and it grew. Your faith grew. Now that, in some senses, is simple, but yet we know that that is really, really difficult to really think about the idea that we have to, at some times, go through these difficult times. We're finding out here that trials really are a faith test. They help us to see that what we're really trusting in for our security and for our meaning in life. A difficult circumstance has a way of weeding out what we're trusting in and what's really important and what's not important. If you're down to the last little bit of money in your life, you realize what kinds of things you should be buying and what you shouldn't be. The same kind of thing happens in our life when we're at the end of ourself, when, we're, at, when we're, we're needing help, we realize what's important and what isn't. 
And it helps us to weed those things out in our life. And in our, really in our deepest hearts, we want to know those things, don't we? We want to know what's important. We want to really know what helps us in our Christian walk. And it's the trials that do that. Let's go to the next part, verses 9 to 11. This is another one. Finances are another way, or another way that God grows us in our walk. Verse 9. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he, has, because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. James zeroes in on one kind of trial. And it makes sense that in this context of talking to these Jewish believers who are spread out through the whole Roman Empire, that he would be talking about this. Because any of you who have transported yourself, especially if it's been because there's been an emergency, to a different place and took up, had to find housing and had to find a new job, that's a financial burden, difficulty that you have to go through. And that's what was happening to these people. So James makes the point that the one who is having it hard um, in their finances or the one who is normally doesn't have a whole lot of income in some senses has an advantage because they know what it has been like to live hand to mouth and trust God. The person who normally would have lots of money might not have developed that skill yet. And so in their, when that hits them, they are having a, a quite a difficult time. We had some friends of ours in Manitoba who uh, we had just come from seminary where we had gone through really financial difficulties and we were sharing with them how God had provided and how we had learned to trust him for our daily bread from hand to mouth, check to check. It was just one of those things where we could see God doing that in our lives. Now they had a very difficult time understanding that because they owned a, um, a farrowing, hog farrowing and feeder barn operation. Part of his barns, a few barns were in Canada, a few of the barns were in the States, and they had millions and millions of dollars of investment in this operation until the hog market crashed and the US, I mean the Canadian dollar tanked. Now all of a sudden, they were in debt. Millions and millions. And now, for them, they had not developed those kinds of skills of trusting, but it was the same. That was something I needed to learn, is that their dependency now was not like mine, where I was depending on God for my groceries next week. They were depending on the millions of dollars they needed to pay the creditors and the salaries of all the people who work for them next week. But it's the same. But yet, it comes down to these kinds of dependencies, these kinds of financial troubles that we're going through are just another one of those things that it's kind of like a, a person who is in weight training. You know how they, why we have weight training and resistance training? Because it helps our muscles to be strengthened. They don't strengthen unless there's resistance. And it's the resistance that helps us to grow. And that's exactly what's happening. Happened to these believers. They needed to be able to understand that in their lives. The third one, the third way in which we can learn to grow is in verses 13 to 15. And that's temptations. Verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. I'm sure you've heard, heard messages where they lift this section out of the passage and not talk about the context now remember, what's the first 
rule of biblical interpretation? Context. And what's the second one? Context. And what's the third one? Context. Okay. So, we need to realize that this is in the context of these pat what he's talking about here. He's talking and giving advice to the to these believers about how they will develop and how they will grow in the different places that they are spread out around the Roman Empire. And he's talking here that temptations is an opportunity to grow. Now let me ex explain a little bit. When you go through a trial, and, and I'm sure all of us have at one time or another, whether it's a persecution, whether it's financial difficulties or whatever it is, it presents us with a choice. That difficulty presents us with a choice. We can either use that as an opportunity to embrace a closer relationship and trust in Jesus. That we can use that as an opportunity to, to understand God's sufficiency in our difficulties and the problems that we're facing in that trouble. We can use that as a time to, to grow and mature in our trust in God. Or, we can go it on our own. We can try to lessen the blow of this difficulty by manipulating our circumstances to do what to us looks like an easy way out. To try to placate ourselves by self-medicating with pleasures or to outright choose against what we know is right but we think it's, we justify it because we need to do it to get by. It may involve fudging our timesheet at work so that we would have a little bit more money. It may be peeking at pornography as a needed distraction to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. It may be flirting with that guy in the store because it makes our heart race and gives us a boost to our self-esteem. You see, we have a choice to make when we're going through difficulty. We can go either way. And what James tells us here is that that's our choice. We can't blame God for that, and you can't blame Satan for that either. That is something that we have a choice to make in those situations. And we need to be people who are recognizing that in our lives. James paints a picture of the end result. If we choose rather to go God's way, you think about it, Jesus is the, the life, right? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If we don't choose that way, what is the other way? It's death. Now, the way he describes it here is he talks about giving birth to death. Now, that, that's, that's a, a, a weird picture, so this is the way I thought about it. If you're ever looking in the Bible for a, uh, a way to talk about zombies, this would be the place. True. Okay, because he's talking about something that's alive, but it's dead at the same time. And that's what a zombie is, right? So if you're witnessing to someone on the plane, this would be a good witnessing opener. Did you know the Bible talks about zombies? James 1.15 talks about zombies. See, anyway. But that's really what, you think about what's happening here. He's saying that you have a choice to make. And if you choose not the way of God, God's way, what's happening is you're, try, you're thinking that the choice you're making is going to meet your needs. It's going to be life-giving. It's going to help you in the situation. But when it goes down that road a while, you realize it's not that. It's actually death. So even though you're thinking it's, a life, it's giving life, it's not going to be. It's going to be living death. And that's what the end result is of a, a life that goes that way. So when you think about it, temptation is one of those things that helps us to grow. It helps us to see the outcome of our, of our life decisions. It helps us to know whether or not where, what our heart is like and helps us to, to make decisions then that follow God. So the other theme that's here, and that's in between these verses that we've been looking at, is ways to understand that growth. So let's go back and look at these. Verses 5 to 8 talk about wisdom. Let's read those. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, 
who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he must believe, he must, wait. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. The man should not think that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. Again, context. We take these verses right out of the context. Um, some of the translations have it as a separate paragraph. Some of them have it as the same paragraph. This is talking about understanding trials in our life. It's talking about, if you, um, one of the definitions for wisdom is seeing our life in God's perspective, from God's point of view. And if we want to understand the issues that we're facing, we need to ask God to help us and give us his perspective on the things that we're struggling with. Um, If we're having difficulty in seeing the bigger picture of the benefits of trials, we need to ask him, and he will do that. Um, God will show us what he sees. Now, it says here that we need to have a prayer of faith what I, what I, how I understand that is that we need to really be asking because we really want to know. If we're asking God, why am I having this trial? It's not the kind of why that says, God, you have to justify to me why I'm going through this trial because if it's not worth anything, I don't want to have anything to do with it. That's not the right kind of why. The kind that I'm talking about here is, God, what are you trying to accomplish in my life through this? That's the prayer of faith, asking for wisdom, of understanding trials. The next one here is in verse 12. Another way of understanding difficulties in our life and the growth process is um, in verse 12, winning at life. Uh, Verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. In ancient times, there were those who, um, whether they were in the Olympic Games or whether they were generals in the army who won a a campaign in in military, they would be given a wreath that was put on their head. It was called a crown, but it was made out of olive leaves. And there wasn't value in the, the olive leaves. It was in what it represented. Kind of like even today, the gold medals that they give at the Olympics, they're not solid gold. They're just plated, and so they're not as worth as much as what they represent. And what James is saying here is that when we as Christians dig in and be able to try to understand the significance of the growth process that we're in and allow God to build into our lives and we really want to understand that and really um, uh, uh, just allow him that that freedom in our lives to, to make the changes that he needs to in that growth process, we win at life, just like an Olympian, just like a general in an army. We are those who really win at life when we're willing to do that. And when we do that, as he says here, he, say, he, he specifically mentions the idea that, um, that we will receive the crown of life to those that who God, I mean, um, because he has promised to those who love him. Think about it this way, as a person who is uh, uh, built into their life like a parent does a child. You know that your, your, a parent loves a child and wants that child to grow, and that's exactly the kind of thing that, that he's talking about here. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 10 to 11. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. So discipline seems unpleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And the word discipline here isn't talking about punishment. It's talking about the kind of resistance training that an athlete does. It's the kind of thing that that an athlete who is self-disciplined makes sure that they eat correctly, they have enough sleep, they do what they can to make sure that they're they're doing what they can be to be most effective. And that's the kind of discipline. But God is the one who is helping us to, to, 
to have our lives molded in such a way that we can be effective in the life that we live. And sometimes that's the difficulties. Those are the financial problems that we face. Those are even sometimes the temptations that we go through that God can use to change us and make him into us in his character. And the last one here, God's part, we find in verses 16 to 18. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be kind of first fruits of all he created. It's easy to, when we're going through difficult times to question God and say, is God really in control? Is he really good? Is he even involved in the difficulties that I'm facing? But all these diversions are the kinds of things that get our eyes off of the off of. Uh, off of him and our trust in him. God has so much invested in us as individuals. If we've accepted Christ as our savior, he's paid with his life for us. He has so much invested in us. And he wants to be able to, so much so that he's willing to have us face hardships from time to time so that on the, out, on the other end, we will mature and we will grow in our Christian walk. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 8 and 9 says in the message, Not only that, but God himself is right alongside to keep you steady and on track until things are all wrapped up by Jesus. God, who got you started in the spiritual adventure, shares with us the life of his Son and our Master Jesus, and he will never give up on you. Never forget that. And I just want to have a last couple things to say. I want us to think about the idea that God does have a master plan. We're, if you think about how, how small of a perspective we have, even on our own life, of the things that we face, it's just this moment in time that we can see. We can see the past. We can't see the future. But God does. And so when we're in this type of situation, we need to learn to trust the one who does have the big perspective. That there are times when even difficult times are for our good. That we're going to learn something that we wouldn't have learned otherwise. God's love and his concern for us and all the investment that he's made in us is something that he won't let us go. He won't let us crash. He wants us to be, to grow in our walk. So, hope that's an encouragement for you. And as we look at um, this passage this week, I hope that this will be used by God to help you to grow. Let's just bow forward a prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us this morning. Um, there's a lot of things here for us to think about. But I pray that there'll be something that each one of us can take home with us, something that'll be of encouragement to us, something that um, will give us hope for the future, something that will be able to motivate us to a deeper walk with you. And so we just want to thank you for these words to us here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. For our benediction, Ephesians 5, 8. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. The Lord bless you.